or thank for uh, um, ACS, Augustus Culture, since I'm also the director of that program. Uh, let, let me begin by uh, starting with a kind of a quirky uh, apology and saying that I don't know how many years we've been doing Freedom School here at Villanova for Martin Luther King Week. We may have been doing it for more than 10 years. And this is the first team, that, this is actually the first time I volunteered to run a class. And so I say to uh, the Peace and Justice folks who are responsible for organizing this, and I'm, uh, I'm glad I'm finally doing one. I apologize for having taken so long. This is going to be a discussion, this is going to be a discussion as opposed to a lecture. And um, for those of you who are here and doing one of your three uh, cultural event series, you know, there will be notes to take, but there's not going to be a lecture. It'll be more like ideas. I teach a philosophy of sports class here when I get the chance, which is not often enough. I was actually going to do it this semester, and then I wasn't able to for uh, other reasons. But um, what I want to do today is sort of what we'd be doing in a philosophy of sports class here at Villanova, where the topic for the day would be race and sports in America. Um, the famous social critic Jacques Barzon said many years ago that if you want to understand America, you need to understand baseball. Now, I, I said he said that many years ago. Because today, if he were saying that, he would say, if you want to understand America, you need to understand football. You know? Or maybe basketball, but not baseball. I mean, baseball would not be on the, on the, uh, on the radar. And it would be maybe two to one football versus basketball. Football, for those who all watch football once a year, you know, on the first last Sunday in January, the first Sunday in February, and it, all of America becomes a football fan that day. For those of us who, uh, you know, live in the, the north, live in cities, um, go to school in the ACC, basketball might be the number one way to understand America. So, assuming that Jacques Barzon was right, that if you want to understand America, you need to understand America's passion for sports, which is what he was saying, well then, what I want to do today is basically look at our passion for two sports in particular. I want to look mostly at, at football and basketball today, and I want to look both at the college and the pro level, and I want to look at the way in which race plays itself out in terms of both college and professional, both football and basketball. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm really would like you folks to feel like you can jump, jump in, ask questions, challenge, and things of that sort, and I'll be asking your opinions as well. So, I've got five or six topics here, and I'm going to start out with the first one, but we can talk about all five or six. For example, starting with stories that have been beaten to death if you watch ESPN or any of the other million <coughs> talk shows on television, is there a double standard in the way Bobby, Barry Bonds has been treated versus the way Mark McGuire was treated three years ago, or even Clemens is being treated now? Has, has the press ganged up on Barry Bonds in a way that white players don't get ganged up on. Is there a double standard for the way in which athletes get judged in the media? Um, if you look at the numbers of po in polling, you'll discover that African-American fans have a very different view about Barry Bonds and his accomplishments and achievements than white fans. African-American fans are prepared to say Barry Bonds belongs in the Hall of Fame and the steroid allegations do not affect where he belongs. You find, so there's a racial divide in terms of the way people in America view the way in which allegations like steroids affects black players versus white players. Um, last April, Don Imus made a fool of himself working with his cohort in crime on, on the radio when he made those ugly references to the uh, Rutgers women basketball team right after they had played a value game on television. Uh, he took their athleticism and turned it against them. Uh, using uh, you know, cheap, you know, contemporary hip-hop racial references in order to have a joke at the expense of those 21-year-old women. Kelly Tillman's been in the news for the last two weeks for lynching Tiger Woods. Uh, Tiger's playing today for the first time this year. Uh, probably he's teeing off just about right now in San Diego. Uh, Tiger said that it was unfortunate. He and Kelly are good friends, but Kelly's been suspended for two weeks for saying that what the players ought to do responding to Nick Faldo's, let's get, they ought to gang up on Tiger, and she said, well, yeah, take him to the back alley and lynch him. Now, um, in both cases of Imus and Kelly Tillman, they were playing off of their cohort's joke. Imus was playing off of his second banana, and then he took it to the next level. And, he, and so each time, they took a line that their second banana fed them, and then they made it worse by a flippant remark that they hadn't rehearsed. Um, the, does anybody know where the word lynching comes from, by the way? Anybody know the etymological notion of lynching? No? 
Uh, if, if, your, if your surname was Lynch, what nationality might you be ethically? Irish. Irish. So guess who was the first lyncher? Irish people. Lynching refers to, I believe, the mayor of Dublin or Galway, whose son was uh, convicted of a crime. And so he, you know, as an authority figure, was in a position to maybe lynch him. And maybe somebody else in the town decided to lynch, lynch his son instead. And the word, you know, lynching becomes that kind of a topic. Why would Kelly Tillman have ever used the concept of lynch? Why would Golf, Golf Week have put that noose on its cover of the magazine the next week? You know, what, what person in the field of communication would actually put a noose on, uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a magazine cover? Um, three years ago, Notre Dame fired Ty Willingham when he was 21 and 15 lifetime, firing the first coach after only three years. Most coaches at Notre Dame have been given five or more. Ty Willingham surfaced at Washington, where he went 4-9 this year, having gone 5-7 and seven last year, thereby slipping in the polls. Um, he was renewed for a fourth year. Was Ty Willingham renewed even though he had a worse season in his third year because Washington couldn't afford to fire him after three years? What Washington did was to fire the white athletic director who had hired Ty Willingham after three years and give Ty a fourth year. Carl Durrell at UCLA was fired this year after five years of coaching with a 35-27 record, uh, a winning record as opposed to a losing record. Uh, he's also black, and he was one of the four or five only African-American coaches in, in, the, in college football. Um, there was no public outcry about why UCLA fired a winning black coach. Uh, was it because people don't expect UCLA to have as high standards? Do people hold Notre Dame to a higher standard? Um, was there something about Ty Willingham that made him worthy of being a person defended in the media for being fired precipitously by, by Notre Dame? Other questions. If there are 75 to 80 percent of NBA basketball players are black, if there's a disproportionate number of football players who are black, if there's a disproportionate number of college football players who are black, why is it that when they graduate, they don't become coaches. Why is the ratio of black coaches to white coaches in America, both at the college and the professional level, so distorted? There are more Af African American players, there's not as many African American assistant coaches. And when you compare the number of African American assistant coaches to head coaches, the numbers become mind boggling. If there's 119 Division I football teams, which there are, and if each team has something between 8 and 10 coaches, which they do, and if a sizable number of those 1,190 coaches are African American at the assistant level, why is it only five graduate to become head coaches? Uh, is this <coughs> the effects and legacy and remnants of a kind of a racism that this country had for 200, 250 years until the 1940s, 50s, and 60s? Uh, at one point, you'll know that no African American could play quarterback in the pros. Every African American who came out of college was turned into a wide receiver or a cornerback. Um, finally, in the 1970s, black African American quarterbacks began to play in the NFL. Finally, in the 80s, they won the Super Bowl. Today, Vince Young gets drafted. He gets drafted ahead of Matt Leiner, and he doesn't get shifted to running back or, or quarterback or, or tailback or, or, or wide receiver. Michael Robinson from Penn State was switched to wide receiver two years ago after he went into the pros. Uh, do we consider this a form of progress? That we now have African American quarterbacks who are valued for being quarterbacks and not for being, quote, athletes or scramblers who can get out of the pocket. When Fran Tarkenden played for the Vikings in the 70s, everybody thought this six foot one, 205 pound guy was wonderful because he scrambled out of the pocket. Let an African-American quarterback scramble out of the pocket, pocket says Donovan McNabb, and they think I'm an athlete, not a quarterback, and that there's a double standard there. Is there sort of an institutional racism in our country? Jacques Cousin says, if you want to understand America, understand sports. Is there institutional racism in corporate America? Is there institutional racism in college and professional sports in terms of coaches, general managers, and owners? How many ownerships have black uh, men or women as part of their ownership team. How many African-American 
general managers are there in the NFL besides Ozzie Newsom? I'm not sure if there's another one. I know Ozzie Newsom is one. Um, another, uh, an another question that I think is really worth pondering here. And guys, feel free to jump in and not just hear me, you know, faff on. One of the things that I'd be really interested in, in, in having us talk about is what about the, uh, the Allen Iverson, Michael Jordan debate? Should African American athletes stay true to their identity and their roots and where they came from? Or should they try to become upwardly mobile and become, you know, a spokesperson for corporate America? I like Mike. You know, and, and, and is Iverson truer to himself by embracing rather than disdaining his neighborhood and his family? What we call his posse or entourage? As opposed to Jordan, who distanced himself from his roots and becomes the spokesperson for McDonald's and, and Coca-Cola. Um, which leads to another question. Should athletes be role models? And if so, should they, who should they be role models for? And what kind of a role model should they be? Mike, any of the above interesting to you? Um, I think, I mean, just talking about Alan Iverson and uh, Michael Jordan, I think when Michael Jordan went and kind of became the, the, the spokesperson for corporate America, he wasn't necessarily purposefully distancing himself from his roots. He was more just kind of, I mean, he was using his notoriety, I think, for personal gain. Or if not for personal gain, then maybe for his family. I'm not sure of the circumstances. But I don't think by Alan Iverson kind of disdaining corporate America that he is really, you know, serving anybody. He's not serving anybody. Well, I mean, he's not actively, I mean, he, he may feel secure to himself that he is staying true to his roots, but I mean, I don't think, you know, going on and becoming a spokesperson for McDonald's or Coca-Cola really is disdaining your roots. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Um, I would agree, like, if you can make money in, in a way like that, if they yeah. offer you a, a deal to do a commercial or something, that doesn't mean that you think any less of your heritage, it just means that you have an opportunity to make some more money. And, so there's nothing wrong about becoming upper middle class or moving out of your socioeconomic environment that you grew up in. Right. I mean, he comes from Lumberton, North Carolina, a real small rural town, <coughs> a kind of tobacco town right off of I-95. I mean, I've driven through Lumberton. I've, I drove past the spot where his father was killed in that, that hijack about 10 years ago. Very, very small, uh, you know, tobacco-based rural town. Yeah. Oh, on a different subject, I think that both of them... I mean, I think absolutely when you become famous for whatever you do, you are a role model, whether you choose to be or not. And I think that the difference is, like, people view Michael Jordan to have a more positive role model influence because he's, it seems like he is representing something different and what's more idealized in our culture than what Alan Iverson is mm -hmm. representing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're both carving out uh, a corporate niche for themselves. Like Iverson is, he's got a lot of sponsorship uh, opportunities for being, you know, true to his roots and kind of like the bad boy in the NBA. And if you look at it, I mean, he really hasn't done anything. You look at some of the NFL guys and different things people have gotten in a lot of trouble doing illegal. Iverson is no Pac-Man Jones, let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I think Iverson is more along the lines of some of the guys who may, um, in, in, in like, rapper movies, you know, there's some guys who are, are Wayne Brady and, and play it straight and get their things there, and then some guys who, you know, who maybe more like, um, you know, play up the fact that, you know, I have a lot of tattoos, I'm, I'm from, you know, where, you know, I'm from North Carolina and I'm going to do this. But I mean, but I think all of it is, is marketing, you know, and while it, it, Iverson may have fallen into that by, you know, being true to his roots, I think that at least now, at this point in his career and his you know, advertising career, you can see just the kind of things that, that he, you know, sponsors and, and goes for. I mean, that's, he's making a lot of money too, so I don't, I don't know if it's generally just Jordan went there, where, what he did, like the upperly mobile idea, mm -hmm. to make money. I mean, I think you can make money either way, and, and it's just how you go about it, but, you know, I don't know, I think you might be reading into it, like, you know, if they're making that conscious decision, you know, to either, you know, go one way or the other. Yeah. Andrew? I, I think both speak for at least some level of equality in, um, in sports and in kind of our, our entertainment that in both cases, like you said, I mean, they're both selling different things, but the fact that, that the corporations will say, this is the person that we think 
can sell to the greatest number of people, and those those people are minorities. That's saying that that part of it's not really important anymore. That these people have reached a level in this institution where they are the most appealing to the most, most general amount of people. I think that that says something about the equality in that industry that you can reach that level and you can become that icon and the minority aspects is not important. Anymore. Right. Right. Your name is Chris. Chris, what's up? Uh, I see the difference between Jordan and Iverson are the fact that Jordan had a better story behind it with the whole Jane Cutler and Hush and basketball team. And I think that helps him to be where he is now because they, they, uh, they become coming from there and become one of the best basketball players to ever live. It gives them a better story behind everything. I mean, I, I, I'll certainly, as a basketball fan, agree with you that the story about Jordan makes it from being cut in high school. Uh, to being uh, the best player that ever played the game. Iverson's got a good backstory too, though, about going to jail. What was it? Was it a cafeteria fight he was in, or something like that? Or a bowling alley fight? It was a bowling alley fight. And so that's an interesting backstory too. It's a different kind of overcoming adversity. This his is more of a social roots adversity. Jordan's more of a athletically. Like, how did this kid go from being no good to being <coughs> the best that ever played the game? We just don't expect that to be the story. Yeah. 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 Um, Your name is Eli. Eli. Go back to the role model thing. Yeah. Um, I wonder if um, sports figures as role models are appealing, just in general, um, because it, it kind of confirms the general belief of like a meritocracy. You know, because sports figures have worked hard, they're dedicated, they they chose something, and then they reach the goal, and now they're successful financially, and you know they're famous, things like that. And and also it kind of could represent like within sports, there's a lot of um, race. Based, race and socioeconomic based social mo or mobility. You know, so there are all these stories of, of these poor kids or these black kids uh, becoming successful. So I wonder if, if that's such an appealing story, which I, I'd be willing to argue doesn't generalize to other industries or, and other career choices. You know, so I wonder if, if that's kind of why it, it's a, a popular... Sports and, enter and, and if you think of sports as part of the entertainment world, in the entertainment world, uh, you know, not to pick on Britney Spears, but you can come from anywhere sure. and become very famous and, and, and rich and wealthy. Uh, and and it, it doesn't matter whether your father went to Harvard or not. You know. um, I, I like the sports as meritocracy argument in, at one level because I do think it is the case that no matter how talented you are, if you don't work at it, you're not going to make it. On the other hand, it's kind of hard to give people credit for the genes that they didn't have anything to do with being born with. There's a certain sense in which how many people in this room wish they had been born with better athletic genes? Raise your hand. <laughs> Notice my hand up, went up right away. I mean, we, we don't deserve or either the genes we we don't deserve the good genes or the bad genes we got. Those are the, that, those are the dice that we get born with, you know? How many people in this room think that they are responsible for the IQ that they were born with? Anybody want to raise their hand and say you chose your IQ? Right? We don't choose our parents, and our parents don't even choose our IQ for us, do they? So that we're all born, John Rawls makes this point about it in the sphere of justice. Rawls thinks of justice and he says, in order to have a good theory of justice, you have to start from the original position, the original state. And the original state, to use a metaphor, would be, if you get into a room and you start arguing about justice, you have to not know who you are. Because if you know who you are, you're going to argue for justice from where you're coming from. right? So if you're rich... Are you going to argue for distributive justice or for keeping personal income? As rich, you're going to be more likely to argue for keeping personal income. You're going to be for low taxes, right? Okay. If you're poor, what are you going to be for? High taxes and social redistribution, so the argument would go. So Rowan says the only way to come up with a fair theory of justice is that you can't argue from knowing who you are. When you push that one step back, and if you think about it, none of us know who we are when we're born, because our genes haven't yet started to kick in and come into play. And we didn't choose our genes to start with. And so if you could think of what it would be like to argue for meritocracy without knowing whether you're starting out. The joke about you know, George Bush is that he was born on third base and he thought he hit a triple. I mean, and we make that joke about all rich people that they're born on third base or with a silver spoon. They have an inherent advantage. You know, if your grandfather was a senator from Connecticut and your father was president, your odds of becoming president turn out to be a lot higher than somebody else. And, and, you, and, you know, and you just can't claim meritocracy in that case. So sports does give us an opportunity for meritocracy. There are lots of talented athletes who have great genetic inheritance 
who are lazy and unmotiv unmotivated and don't use that talent. I mean, that's absolutely the case. And then there are people who have minimal physical talents, Pete Rose, Bobby Clark, who become the best at what they do because they don't know how to quit and they know how to bend the rules in their favor every which way they can in order to become the best uh, at what they do. Role models. Anybody else have a theory? I mean, you've got favorite athletes. Are they, are they in any way ever role models for you? And if so, in what way are they a role model for you? Or do you, is your view of your favorite player the same as your view of your favorite rock star? or artist, and it's just somebody that you like, but you don't want to become like that person. Anybody look to sports for role models, for inspiration, for this is the way you should live? You like? Know for me, it doesn't generalize. To, like, if I were pursuing a career in sports, maybe. You know, but like, at this point, I'm not. So it doesn't go farther than that for me. They're mm -hmm. entertainment figures. Chris, what were you going to say? Oh, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say, and your name is? Terrence. Terrence. Um, personally, I don't look at sports role models. I mean, I know like little kids, they'll look up to, you know, sports figures. Um, I know even at, you know, college football games, little kids are like... What's your autograph? Yeah, all that type of stuff. You know, they look at, you know, sports, you know, football, football, basketball, baseball, whatever, with players as gods and stuff like that. And, but I feel like, you know, athletes, professional athletes, they're more so role models for other, other athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, these are professionals. They got there. They, you know, went from being a little kid playing backyard baseball to, you know, someone in the pros. You know, now hitting home runs. You know, like it's his job. It is his job. But I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> right. 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 And 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 you know, a nice job to have. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, like Brian Westbrook grows up five eight, tears yeah. out a knee in high school, and all of a sudden he's the most. The second most famous running back in the NFL is that is, is that a story that's inspirational for it's telling you about how to live your life, or is it just inspirational about one day I can make it in the NFL too? I think it's I think sports is all about adversity. You know, whatever sport it is, you know, someone has some type of you know um, problem they went through. So they either got cut from a team, injured a knee, something happened to them where they have to strive to get themselves better. Whether it's just you know a hard workout where they were on the brink of passing out or maybe even death or whatever it didn't yeah. be, and um, you know it's just that whole sense. Of, well, human life is adversity, and just growing up to get over this hump is you know I think what sports is all about. Well, you know I'll tell you that this what we're getting to right now isn't square on the topic of, about race in America, but it certainly is square on the topic about sports. Because if you want to turn it around, Michael Novak, the contemporary philosopher, says that if you want to understand human life, understand sports. Novak literally does argue that sports is a metaphor for life, and you just made the same argument. You just said that life was about adversity, and in sports you find out how people deal with adversity. And how you deal with adversity in sports shows you how you will deal with the journey of life and life itself. You know, you use the metaphor of life as either a journey or adversity. Or think of it as Beowulf and Grendel, adversity within a journey, you know, and we all have our Grendel, we're all Beowulf, we all want to be a hero, we all want to face up to the, advers the adversity that we have, and how you meet your adversity, like Beowulf met Grendel, tells you something about who you are. And so, you know, Philip Rivers playing with a, with a ligament, you know, tear, I mean, you know, unbelievable. I mean, how, you know, how, how does that guy do that, right? And he stands in the pocket and he knows one, one bad hit. And that leg's going in three different directions, right? And you still play the whole game. So that tells you something about, you know, Philip Rivers' heart. I exactly. So uh, the argument that if you want to know about a person, know about what kind of athlete they aspire to be, you know, and you use, you know, role models of people who deal with adversity as opposed to who flee from adversity, you find out something about that, that person. You had your hand up. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that I guess the motivation and determination that you see in sports, I think, is not more obvious anywhere else than it is in sports. And although like it's not directly applicable to me what I went through in life and I may have different goals, but I can still apply that motivation to my life, like make it a part of me and help me achieve my goals. Yeah. See, I mean I just think that's absolutely right and that's why I love to teach the philosophy of sport. Because I really do believe that sports is a area within which you can find out about yourself. I mean you can find out about yourself by making sure you take out the trash. You know, whether you're lazy and, you know, and, and, and just, you know, absolutely dirty and just don't have a clue about how to clean your room. That teaches something about yourself as well. 
Well, finding out how you respond to adversity in sports and competition really does, you know, tell you something about the kind of person that you already are or the kind of person that you need to become. I mean, I, I really do think that's true. Uh, Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I was just kind of thinking that, you know, when I'm looking for a role model, um, you know, you, you, when you look for a role model, you look for someone who has, like, the, the right values, the right motivation. And so when, I, when I'd say I look at sports, I wouldn't so much find a role model there because of, like, the sport, because that's, like I said, it's where a person's, like, um, a, uh, goals and, everything, and their motivation is more um, apparent. So if you're finding a role model in sports, you're not necessarily finding your model, role model in an athlete because of his, um, like, athleticism or his participation, but because of his or her, um, like actual like values that are just simply more apparent because that they are, are because they are an athlete. Because they're a public figure doing public things. It's not just being a public figure; it's doing public things as a public uh, figure. You get to see the person in competition, uh, which is a lot different than being told what they can and cannot do. L let me begin. Uh, let me go back to the question about racism in sports today at the college and professional level. Uh, let me start out with two or three premises, which I think are fairly uh, non-controversial. Uh, this country has had a history of racism. We can tell the story of how the racism in terms of white versus black, in terms of slavery starts. Um, the, the corner was turned in this country at two or three different occasions. Uh, Lincoln in the Civil War is one place where it gets turned. Um, uh, Equal Opportunity Voting Act is another way where it gets turned. The Freedom Marches of the 50s and 60s is another place where it gets turned. Um, and the progress in the last 30 years is, it has been the playing out of that. Um, speaking for myself, you know, who am old enough to remember when Villanova University was Villanova College, um, uh, the world I grew up in is a world very different from the world you appear to have grown up. Uh, people like us remember racism in a more overt way. For you, racism is both an historical story. Martin Luther King is an historical story. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, march with Martin Luther King uh, the day after he was assassinated. My girlfriend at the time knocked on my door at 8 in the morning, woke me up and said, there's a silent march down, going down South Bend at 10 in the morning. Let's do the silent march. So for me, Martin Luther King was history. There was a, there was a real war going on at that time in a way in which now people can say, well, you know, there's no racism. As a matter of fact, you'll know sometimes all those students will say that if anything, affirmative action, you know, discriminates against whites. Whites, whites are the persecuted minority in our country right now because of affirmative action. Well, I, I think it's great that we've gotten to the point where you can actually try to make the argument that whites are being persecuted through affirmative action. That goes to show that the world isn't as unfair and unjust as it was in the world that I grew up in. Um, but is there still racism in America? Final point. I mean, I think it's kind of clear that there is still the vestiges of what we call racism in America, not the racism that I experienced 50 years ago. So, taking what I consider to be uncontroversial facts, do you think that in sports, at the college professional level, that racism in those areas is the same as it is in the rest of the country? It's greater or it's less? We all have to have an opinion about that. I'm going to start with the green sweater. More the same or less, do you think? In sports? No, than in, than in the rest of the country, um, the rest of our life. I don't know, I guess it's like different, like... I guess like what we're saying with like the coaches, like there's like there's not like a balance there, and it, maybe like there's more like stere like there's still stereotypes as like when it comes to like I don't know. But that fact about there being significantly less head coaches, even though there's disproportionately a large number of black players playing the sport, does that hint to you of, of, of institutional racism yeah. still play or the old boys network, which is the same thing as institutional racism in this case? And your name is Adrian. Adrian, okay. Um, back there, your name is? Jack. Jay? Jack. 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 Great first name. I, I hardly approve of that name. Uh, what do you think? More of the same or less? I think there's less racism. Because? Because, because just the fact that everybody works as hard as everybody else to get there. And, I mean, you know, being a professional athlete, it's not easy. And whether you're white or black, it's the same trouble, the same, you know, struggle. So you think uh, Eli's meritocracy argument says that the playing field is more level in sports than it is in corporate America? Okay, I mean, fair enough, fair enough. 
Mike, I'm going to say it's pretty much the same. I think it actually supports Mirror's real life a lot. Because, I mean, you talk about affirmative action, and I don't know the rule of football, but I know a, a team looking for head coach is obligated to interview at least one minority coach. The Rooney Rule. Rooney Rule. Um, Although, I, don't, I, don't think, I think Bill Parcells violated that rule last probably. week. But, he um, hired the first person he talked to, right? But, um, I mean, also, you look at, you know, I don't know, a major corporation, but a major corporation has a CEO who is black. It's considered a big deal. Last year at the Super Bowl, one of the biggest stories was, I mean, Lovey versus... Um, the guy who won it all. Um, right. I mean, like, the biggest story of the Super Bowl was that we're going to have a black, cor or a black uh, coach who's going to win the Super Bowl for the first time. I think still special attention is paid to race in the same way that the real world is. Michael, I think it's absolutely the case that you're right, that the, the best backstory for the Super Bowl was that we finally have gotten to the point of progress where we can have two black coaches actually at the top of their game playing for the Super Bowl. And that wasn't possible 10 years ago because there were no black coaches at all. Uh, so I think that's, I mean, that, that's the feel-good part of the story but of how we're better off than we used to be. The fact that it was a story is kind of indicative that there still is racism. But the fact that there is a story tells us that there's a history here that's playing out, <laughs> and part of the backstory is, is both the history of the story, as well as current conditions. You had your hand up, and your name is? Um, Kelly. Kelly, what's up? I was just going to say that it's kind of a sports. It's pretty much like whoever has the ability of the talent and the time is going to get the position. So I think it's kind of an equal playing field on a lot of levels. You're going to see like more black players on some sports and more white players on other sports. Like ice hockey, you're going to see a lot more white players than you're going to see black. But in something like football or basketball, it's completely changed over the years. So. I think it's an equal playing field more so now than in corporate America is. So. Uh, well, right now we're leaning towards the theory that we think that as far as <coughs> athletes go, it's level. As far as coaching opportunities, it's not so level. Um, uh, do you have your hand back there? No? And your name is? Bridget. Bridget, do you have, uh, do you have a strong feeling one way or the other as to whether there's more or less racism? I don't, honestly, right now. I don't, I don't know. I okay, fair enough. Yes? Oh, sorry. No, I, do, I do have a, uh, that was no way. I think that it's interesting what you, how you separated the coaching and executives with the players. Right. I think that the coaches and executives are still corporate. You know, so I think that they fall into a corporate world, whereas in actually playing the sports, it's you know, the person in the right place at the right time is still the person who's going to get it. You know, if you're a coach, you want your best team out there. Right. You know, and it, so I don't think it trickles down. But I think there is a, a separation still. Where as the playing maybe getting equal, but in the corporate idea of it, you know, for whatever reason, I think there is still some residual effects of yeah. And I'm suggesting that for whatever reason, among other things, oh, yeah. the old boy network, old boy network, and network institutional yeah. racism. Yeah. Did you have your hand up? I was just going to say the same thing. I think it's easier for uh, if you're comparing like athletes to like a CEO in a comp like in a com company. It's easier for an athlete to like display their their skills and their talents. I think than a say a black CEO because they may have the same exact skills as a white person but I don't think that it's as easy for them to display that because they aren't given as great as an opportunity as athletes are. And, and in terms of people being promoted in a job, when you're competing on the athletic playing field uh, with a videotape running, you can run back to film and see who beat whom to the hole, right? You know, in the office we don't have the game of Monopoly in the office in the same way that you can say, I should hire this person rather than that person to be the CEO. Because there's, you know, there may be gamesmanship in the corporate world, but there's no game that has the rules that allows you to say, who, which executive made it to, you know, hence we all watch, you know, Donald Trump's, you know, fire every lawyer and apprentice and stuff like that, right? And we know that there are no inherent rules as to why somebody gets kicked off the island on the apprentice show during the summer. Get your hand up. Uh, I was going to go back to what he said about, um, what did you say? About, um, I can't remember it. <laughs> How there's more uh, publicity about when there is a black CEO or with the super. Oh, Bowl. yes, right. right. Um, I would say that while there is more publicity towards it, it's in a different connotation. Whereas we see it, well, I mean, for the most part, we see it as like a triumph to say that, oh, look at this, like, we look how far we've come in our history when we've come from a history of racism mm -hmm. to be able to say, you know, look at how we have black men and women who are competing from jobs as CEOs and who are in the Super Bowl. And I think it's we're proud of that instead of being like instead of looking at it in a negative light. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I almost think like talking about public and media, I almost think that media gives more sympathy and attention to those black athletes than white athletes. Because at the same time, like it is a level playing field, 
but at the same time, if you look at, take Michael Jordan, for example, he came from being cut on a high school basketball team and came to be a superstar in the NBA. But if you take an athlete like Peyton Manning, sure, he came from a family of football players. It's probably in his genes, but does that mean he worked less? Does that mean he deserves less to be there? Yet Peyton Manning doesn't receive the same attention and sympathy that Michael Jordan does for his upbringing and his past. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm I'm not sure if I want to go exactly 100 percent in that direction. But does somebody else want to respond to, to that point? That was just me. Well, I think Don would that would disagree. So, I mean, the well, we do know that Don would yeah, disagree. Sorry. Right. I mean, I think I mean I wonder if what the, the comments that he made in the beginning of the season. I wonder if that is true because I think it, it is hard to tell. McNabb that clearly thinks that he is treated differently because he's yeah. an African American yeah. quarterback, and he, and he said that and has made that totally clear. Um, the, the Peyton Manning story, though, I, I felt like last weekend, the last two weekends, um, all I did was see Peyton Manning, you know, going down a hallway at a hotel, you know, calling out plays, right? You know, and then looking at the camera and says, I know you want to be me, right? Thump, 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 but, you know, gonna, I mean, I, I think Peyton Manning gets more airtime than almost anybody these days. Uh, he gets the advertising dollars, and so I, I would want to turn it around and say, not only am I not convinced that, that he's being treated less fairly than Jordan, but that it's because he's a white quarterback that he's getting the endorsements that he gets. Now, I mean, having said that, I don't think that you can make a blanket claim that only white athletes like Cal Ripken get to drink milk and have the white thing around their lips on television. Uh, Tiger Woods, the last time I looked, was not white, and he can have any endorsement he wants from any part of corporate America, and he does. Um, and... and uh, uh, certainly, it's not because he's Caucasian that he gets those those uh, dollars. I think it's more a function of who corporate America thinks will represent their product to the point that the consumer will buy their product and endorse it. And I think that the point Andrew made was that Iverson was representing Reebok, and Reebok was pitching their sneaker line to high school kids, and particularly urban high school kids. And so they were comfortable with having him as a pitch man for their product, to their audience, to their, their consumer basis. On the other hand, Buick has Tiger Woods driving their cars. Now, if you think about it for a second, is there any car in the world that you wouldn't associate Tiger Woods with besides Buick? <laughs> think about it. Think about it. It can't possibly be the case that we're doing word association, and I say Tiger Woods, and you go, Buick. <laughs> That's not on the table, right? So, why is Buick doing that? Not because any, any of us believes that Tiger Woods would ever drive a Buick if he had a choice, <laughs> but it's because the demographics of, of white 60-year-old business insurance executives, <laughs> i.e. people who drive Buicks, you know, watch golf, right? And that's why when you watch golf tournaments, you know, the, there are only three or four products that they sell on golf tournaments, you know, insurance and cars. <laughs> that's about it. Right, because the, the kind of person who watches a golf tournament tends to be white, 55, and a, and a business exec, who, who either is selling insurance or wants a lot for himself, right? And, and drives uh, a, an old-fashioned car. Um, anybody else wants to take a bite on the question as to whether or not the racism in sports is showing as a model how to overcome racism in society? That sports is a great theater for thinking about how to overcome stereoty stereotyping of racial and ethnic origins. That sports is, in fact, a true level playing ground that allows us to rethink our, our categories of difference. Any, does anybody believe that in this room at all? Andrew? Well, I, I mean, kind of like with what I said before, I think it, it shows how one of the most powerful motivators just in the fact that race when you're talking about you I and mean, if you're going to talk about a team and wins or if you're going to talk about sports and entertainment you're going to talk about like advertising dollars and, and viewers the race is irrelevant i mean it's about how do you maximize the most money and the best you know the best activity for your team and in a realm like that the the race becomes irrelevant mm -hmm. and i think that that, that it has that going for it, that that the push to win and the push to to make the most is going to slowly eat away at any racism that's kind of hanging around. And I think that it's a powerful motivator in the rest of 
society. I mean, I don't. I, I, I think that any moral issues with racism are certainly applied, but they're not the reason that racism is falling away from sports. I don't think it's that anyone told them it was wrong. You just realize that it's not. It's not helpful to to keep that in your mind. Should Kelly Tomlin have been fired for saying they should lynch him in the back alley? She got a two week suspension. Does anybody think she should have been fired? Yes. Yes? Because? Well, for, uh, she was referring to Tyler Woods. Yes. And um, last I checked, lynching, you know, back um, towards slavery days was a big part of, you know, what black people did whenever a black person did something that they didn't like. So that's very disrespectful and uncalled for on a public um, display. Yeah. Anyone else agree? Yeah? Yeah. And also, with what you brought up the Rutgers women's basketball team, like that comment that was made, that was inappropriate on some I must have, he got suspended for, it turned out to be like a suspension. He got fired for six months. Yes, you. Well, and that firing them kind of says that it's okay. Like they just need a suspension and that it's acceptable to say things like that as long as you give them a slap on the hand. Mm hmm. <coughs> well, like it's, it wasn't an acceptable thing to say, but Golf Week also exploited it to their own level by putting the news in the cover. Mm -hmm. But what, like obviously she didn't choose, like have the right word choice, but she was actually complimenting Peggy Woods and his talents in the statement. Uh, it's a very backhanded compliment. I understand what yeah. you're saying, but it's, like, it's very backhanded. Yeah. But like it obviously wasn't the right thing to say and the word choice wasn't like the correct thing to do, but I think to fire someone for that, like, is a little bit over the top, even though, like, it is a derogatory statement. Anybody else have a strong position on this? Yes. Um, well, I think that more action maybe should have been done on the part of the golf magazine because they had a lot of time to think about that, and they put apart, like, they knew what else was happening in the media. And her comment, um, like, why I do agree that I think she should have been fired was, you know, in a quick response to someone else, they had such a long time. I mean, I think it was like two weeks. He, he, he had time, but of course he did get fired. The, yeah. ed the editor of Golf Week did get fired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and afterwards said, well, you know, we're just trying to make this, you know, relevant and controversial. Um, <coughs> Bill. Um, I believe that uh, the, the fact that the, the comments are said is one thing, and but the fact that the, the media will inevitably exploit it to, to the best of their ability is another thing and it, it, there's nothing to prevent it but I think that that just that just keeps the, the racism going really like I think that the more the more you hear okay this guy said this comment and got fired for it the more people say oh boy there's there's still racism out there yeah I, I guess one of the things that I think about and I use this example is that I have a perception of the media being selective and when it does and doesn't get on this moral high horse. And I find the differences between the treatment of Ty Willingham and Carl Doral at UCLA sort of fascinating because the, me the media went after one example but you know, laid low on the other example. And in terms of winning records, the coaches were Willingham was 21 and 15, uh, Carl Doral was 35 and 27 at UCLA. They had roughly the same kind of, of, of winning percentage. One comes from a football factory, the other one isn't at what is perceived to be a football factory at UCLA. That might be one of the reasons why the media uh, jumps on the football fact uh, factory to look at it. Uh, the, here's, the, here's the last thing that I want to talk about. I, and I want to talk about us, and I want to you know, bring this home. Does anybody, you know, uh, the last two years, Villanova's first year of class has been 20% minority. Uh, which is the largest percentage of students ever that in, in, in one year, let alone years back to back, that have been admitted to Villanova. And so the, the population of Villanova, the face of Villanova, has changed. You're part of the change. Your experience changed. You people who are freshmen with two classes back to back with 20% non Caucasian students think, well, this is the way Villanova always used to be, that there used to be this greater diversity that Villanova once had, which of course it didn't always have. But when you watch our basketball team play, um, Scotty and you know, um, you know Corey and Corey, you know and Dante, Shane. Well, you know where I'm going with this. There's not a lot of diversity on the basketball team, unless you can't count Andrew Watt, right? 
um, are t are the first ten players of play are not Caucasian. What does it say about an institution that has 80% of its students being Caucasian but 100% of its basketball players being African American? Are we the only institution that's like that in this country? No? <laughs> yes? Uh, I kind of disagree with like the application process in general of just like having race even be a part of the application mm -hmm. because it really has like nothing to do with your ability to work hard or anything that has to do with your academic or athletic or any ability that you have other than just like your skin color. <clears throat> And that's like the application process in pretty much every university around the country. So I just, I don't know, I've always kind of disagreed with the fact that that's even on the application because mm -hmm. it doesn't really like mean, like, that is almost racial, the fact that it's on there because it really shouldn't stand for... It is like, racial, right? Yeah. I mean, and, I mean, it is. Asking about race is asking a racial question. I mean, I mean, you can't deny that. If you ask a racial question, then that's a racial question. If you ask the person's sex, and then that's a question that is talking about a person's gender. Yeah. I have a friend of mine who uh, has some classes with several of those players. And, um, he said that they often don't take pop quizzes if they don't want to, and that sometimes on test days they'll come in with a version of the test and just copyright off the test, and he doesn't do anything about it. So, I think you guys to hack that one up. And is that a story that you think is common in the dorms? No, that was his uh, eyewitness. And I, a, a, a specific eyewitness case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what? Um, two things to respond to. But going off of that, I think that, I guess this doesn't really apply generally to sports, but if, if you want colleges to be vehicles of social mobility, which I'm assuming that that's kind of a general assumption. Like, I, I, well, I think they should. That's a, that's a general assumption today. It wasn't a general assumption 75 years ago. Okay, well, let, let's keep right. it today then. So, yeah. so if, if you want colleges to be vehicles of social mobility, and if you look at it, a lot of times um, things are based around race. You know, if you have a traditionally oppressed group of people and you want to afford that group of people in general social mobility, I think that it can be taken into account on the application. Because you're not looking at just individuals, you're looking at individuals within entire social context and historical context. I just finished filling out a 45-minute questionnaire on the internet that Father Peter sent out to the, a note to the faculty yesterday saying you're about to get a Survey. It's a national survey. Every country, every school in the country is going to be asked to have their faculty fill out this 45-minute questionnaire on the internet about you know what what's going on in your you know in your school. And so it asks every question from you know how many classes do I teach to what kind of toothpaste do I use to you know do I prefer Kelly's over you know uh, Flippin Bailey's um, and it, 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 but it asks a lot of questions about diversity on campus. And when they ask questions about what classes do you teach. There was a disproportionate number of questions that asked if I taught racial questions, race, race questions, or gender questions. I mean, they didn't ask if I taught questions, taught classes about art, but they wanted to know whether or not I incorporated um, gender or, 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 or race matters into my courses. It's a national phenomenon that people are tracking the role of race and diversity in American universities today, and that was not always the case. And 75 years ago. Only one kind of person would presumably go to college, and that would be a person who came from a particular kind of a, of a family. That's why, in the last 75 years, so many people who have gone to schools have gone as first-generation college students. And for many years, the students who went to Villanova were first-generation college students, just as I myself was a first-generation college student in my family. Uh, the last thing here, the, um, are you familiar with the NCAA tracking graduation rates? Of, of, of athletes. I pulled out all the data for the last three years, the 205, 206, and 207 graduation rates of schools. And there's a uh, Joe Lapchick, who's down at the University of Central Florida, whose father was actually a basketball coach in the Big East at St. John's, runs a Center for the Study of Sports and, and Society and Ethical Issues. And he did um, analysis of the teams that went to the, uh, the football games this year, the bowl games in college, and last year's NCAA tournament results, both men and women. And they published the graduation success rates. Graduation success rates include, it doesn't count against you if the, if the player transfers out of school, as long as they leave in good academic standing. So in other words, if somebody jumps to the pros, it doesn't count against you that they didn't graduate, because they allow that to count. There's another uh, graduation rate called the federal rate, where if you 25 kids come in on scholarships, 
and five go to the pros, those five get counted against graduating. So already you're down to 75% good. Okay, this, this rate does not count against you if you jump out of school. Um, the overall student athletes, the overall student athlete at Georgia, 65% um, of the students in Georgia, student athletes graduate. 67% um, of the white football student athletes graduated. 29% of the African American football students graduated. Uh, the Ohio State team, 77% um, of their student athletes graduate. 43% of their black football players graduate. Um, another school that has historically been a power in the United States is Texas. 74% of their student athletes graduate. 30% of their African American football players graduate. Um, Georgia Tech. Really good engineering school. 69% of their student athletes graduate. 81% of their football players graduate who are white. 34% of their black football players graduate. Um, Georgia Tech's basketball team, male. 42% of their basketball players graduate. Um, Gonzaga, white school from the Northwest has no black players on it, 44% of their basketball players graduate. Um, Texas, we said 30% of the football players graduate, 30% of the basketball players graduate. Uh, UNLV, where our former coach Raleigh Massimino went to, where Jay Wright coached with Raleigh for five years before he went to Hospital, 17% uh, of UNLV basketball players graduate. Um, University of California at Berkeley, Cal Berkeley, in 2005, 0% of their basketball players graduated. At the same time that in 2007, 73% of their women basketball players graduated. 73% versus 0%. Um, in terms of the overall national football rankings, the two schools with a 100% graduation rate last year were Central Connecticut State and Davidson at 100%. Navy at 98, William and Mary 98, Georgetown Division 3 98. Um, coming in at 11th at 95 was Bucknell and Notre Dame. Coming in at 13th was Lehigh and Stanford at 94. This is of all football players. Coming in at 15th at 93% was Lafayette, Andy Talley's football team here at Villanova, Wake Forest, Duke, and Air Force. Villanova is in with company like Lafayette, Wake Forest, and Duke. Going down to the bottom of the pile, Florida A&M graduated 25% of its football players. As I said before, Texas in that year was down to 40%. Georgia was 41% that year. Um, there seems to be, and these are the numbers right here, and anybody who knows how to Google can pull these numbers down like I did. There seems to be uh, a couple of obvious facts. Um, overall, oh, let me read you the NCAA thing. The NCAA and their press blurb, do you think they're going to say that they're doing really well or really poorly? They're going to say they're doing really well, right? They're not going to pick out the bad numbers. Here's what the NCAA says. This is their own words. 63% um, of student Division I athletes who began college as freshmen in 2000 graduated within six years as compared to 62% of students at all kinds. So student athletes graduate 63% of the time. All students graduate 62% of the time. Proving, therefore, that student athletes are more likely to graduate than regular students. Um, when further examined by race and gender, the federal data shows that virtually every subgroup of student athletes is exceeding the graduation rate of their counterparts in the student body. In particular, African American students graduate at a rate seven points higher, 53%, than all African American students, 46%. Male African American students graduated at a rate 10 points higher than other male African-American students, 49% to 39%. So what do they say in their publicity blurb? Black athletes graduate 10 times, 10% 10 more than do regular black college students, highlighting the positivity in being a black student athlete. You're more likely to graduate. Now, you still only graduate half the time, but you're more likely to graduate because you're in athletics. Um, so the NCA says that 
Being a student athlete makes you more likely to be a successful student when compared to the entire student body and when you break out the demographics for men and women. What, it doesn't sh what, what this little blurb doesn't show, however, is what I talked about for the first five minutes, and that was the dismal numbers in football and basketball and the difference between black and white in football and basketball, and the difference between male and female. In other words, one of the reasons why the graduation rate is so high for all athletes is that white women athletes pull up black athletes who are male in, in football and basketball. And so if you want a true balanced picture of, I think, how race and gender, for that matter, plays itself out in America, I think you should look at the graduation rates of schools to see how schools, in fact, do uh, uh, are able to graduate the students who they bring in, and whether or not students and certain sports are at greater risk or greater reward for for graduating. Comments to what I just said. Have you ever heard those numbers before? Comments, Chris, you've heard those numbers before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get what? Hey, the numbers usually that we got. Statistics never lie, but liars use statistics. One of the great old time lines in the history of the world, right? Yeah. And you can manipulate these numbers. I just try to make the point that the NCAA is manipulating the numbers to say how much better of a job we're doing. Because black athletes graduate more than regular black students. On the other hand, as we just saw, in certain cases, certain black athletes do more, much more miserably at certain schools than do regular black students going to college. And if you go to a, a, a factory like Texas or Tennessee or Arkansas or Georgia, the numbers are just you know, deplorable. I mean, they are just absolutely deplorable at certain, uh, in, at certain factories. And they're also deplorable in schools that have a good reputation, Ohio State and Michigan. Their numbers are better than Georgia and Arkansas, but their numbers compared to what happens at Boston College, Notre Dame, Villanova, are, are, are equally deplorable. And this factors out whether or not they leave school early to go in the pros, which you would think might be the reason why the football factories have a worse graduation record, because these, they've got the best athletes who are leaving early. But that, that's, that's accounted for in these numbers. Any last minute observation? Yeah, Elon. Does that take into account um, people who entered professional sports after their four years? Like, if they didn't graduate, but then... It's a six-year graduation rate. If they come back and finish their... The, the, GF, the graduation rate is uh, six years to complete your, your degree. Mm -hmm. A lot of people redshirt and are in college for five years anyway. Right. This, is, this is a six-year thing. And by the way, for regular students, there's a four-year graduation rate and a five-year graduation rate that we use when we talk about our graduation rate. And there's also a six-year. A lot of people don't finish in four years, you know? The four-year model, lots of people who go to Villanova finish in four years. Lots of people who start out at community college and transfer do not graduate in four years. So four years is the graduation rate for really good academic schools. That's not the norm for all schools. So giving athletes a chance of six years to graduate is, is, is I think, legit and fair to look at a school's efficiency in graduating the players. So that's people who don't enter professional sports at all in their life? Also that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, you just heard him say thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.